Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We once again have a lot of news to cover with Starship and potential delays for Flight 3. A Falcon 9 first with the launch of Cygnus NG-20 mission, Rocket Lab launched their first of three dedicated launches for North Star, Earth and Space, and we saw back-to-back -back satellite launches in China, just four hours apart. All of this and much, much more, let's kick things off. Ship 28 will be the starship that SpaceX will use for Flight Test 3, and Booster 10 will be the Super Heavy. Last Monday, we were hoping that rollout for both vehicles would be soon. Booster 10 had its hot staging ring installed, and since this seals off the internals of the vehicle, it's generally a pretty good sign that all works are complete. But it's now looking like some more work needs doing to the starship. Ship 28 was placed onto the Raptor engine install stand, and workers subsequently removed one of its vacuum Raptor engines on Friday. This isn't necessarily a disastrous setback or anything, the engine may be being removed simply to allow greater access to the ship's engine bay, perhaps to make some upgrades following data gathered from the flight and loss of Ship 25. We also saw the replacement of one of the vehicle's central sea level optimized Raptors. Here it is prior to installation, captured by Boca Chica Gal for NASA spaceflight. It wasn't just the vehicle's engine section receiving attention last week, we also saw workers work on the vehicle's forward flap. Wait a second, is that guy on his phone? I wonder what he's doing. Maybe he's playing Star Trek Fleet Command, the ambitious open world MMO and epic mobile strategy game which has also completely coincidentally sponsored this video. Star Trek Fleet Command is available for free on iOS, Android, Mac and PC and mobile with a Scopely account. Switching between platforms while keeping all your progress intact really couldn't be any easier. Set your phasers to snag a copy by clicking the link below or scanning the QR code on screen join the battle, and prepare to boldly go where no one has gone before. Kick off 2024 with the first stage of the Enterprise arc, where you can explore the aftermath of the temporal Cold War plotline from Season 3 of Star Trek. Two new officers, the dedicated and quick-thinking Trip Tucker, and the stoic and unwavering T'Pol. You can enjoy 10 new Enterprise-themed missions and 10 new side missions, all available right now. You can also enjoy a new feature, Wave Defense. Wave Defense introduces a new way for players to socially interact based on Wave Defense teams that transcend alliances. Players defend a central point from waves of increasingly powerful enemies. Collaboration is the key to victory. If you're a new player, then you can use the promo code WARPSPEED to get a special starter pack, which will give you 10 epic shards of Kirk to give you the best start in exploring strange new worlds. Sponsors like Star Trek Fleet Command allow me to keep on doing what I do here, so big thank you to them for sponsoring today's video. Anyway, hopefully all these works with Ship 28 is all fairly standard stuff that won't create too much of a delay for Flight 3. Heck, there is also the very wild possibility that we'll see Ship 26 fly at some point as well. Crews continue to work on the mysterious external stringers fitted to the vehicle's exterior. Right now, the working theory is that this is either a refueling tanker prototype or built to be expendable just so that SpaceX had something to stack on a Super Heavy to allow faster testing of Starship's first stage. Though with delays to orbital launches, we now of course have fully built starships with flaps and heat shields and everything, so I'm definitely curious about what the real purpose of Ship 26 is. Visibility into the Mega Bay is likely to become a lot more limited soon, as SpaceX continues working on installing the door. Here you can see a partial closing test last week, which took place on Tuesday. But on the subject of the Mega Bay, we got a rare treat in the form of some official SpaceX photos of its interior. We can see three fully stacked Super Heavies in this shot, with the two stacks either side being the forward and aft portions of Booster 13, which is still being built. Lab Padre captured the arrival of two of the booster's carbon dioxide pressure tanks at the build site, which were then lifted and installed onto the booster. Speaking of tanks, one was removed from the launch site early last week and transported down to Macy's. Its replacement was then lifted into position shortly afterwards. Installation of the new walls at the launch site continued, with the placement of more concrete sections. 
Stage Zero itself was tested during the night. We saw simultaneous retraction testing of both the booster quick disconnect and ship quick disconnect interfaces, and swing out of the ship quick disconnect arm. It's very likely that SpaceX are experimenting with changes in timings due to the damage inflicted on the ship quick disconnect arm during the launch of Booster 9 and Ship 25. A few days later, the booster quick disconnect hood was opened as crews continued working on this structure. Shot of the week has to go to NASA Spaceflight Starbase Live, who captured a meteor passing through the sky behind the launch tower. Uh, I don't really have anything to add here, but hey, it's pretty neat, right? <laughs> the United States has a few ways of getting to the International Space Station. For crew, the only option right now is SpaceX's Crew Dragon, with Starliner still in a bit of a mess of delays. For cargo resupply, we have both SpaceX's Falcon 9 launched Cargo Dragon or Northrop Grumman Cygnus launched on their Antares rocket. However, the Antares rocket isn't an option anymore due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine since the rocket's engines come from Russia and booster comes from Ukraine. A new Antares 300 series rocket is still under development that won't depend on Russian or Ukrainian parts, but that's not ready yet and so for now, Cygnus will be launching on Falcon 9. The first of the total of three planned Falcon 9 launched Cygnus missions took place on Tuesday last week, launching from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 40. The first stage successfully landed back at base shortly after stage separation, and take a look at the second stage engine. It has a much shorter engine bell than the one that SpaceX normally uses, but it would have no doubt been cheaper, and I guess this was worth the efficiency trade-off for SpaceX. Another interesting thing is that, unlike Dragon, Cygnus needs to be launched inside a fairing, but due to some of the payloads being very time sensitive, they needed to be loaded up at the very last moment. To accommodate this, a small doorway was built into the fairings to allow pre-launch access, but unfortunately my Google Foo skills weren't able to turn up any footage of this. Anyway, the Cygnus was successfully berthed to the station with the Canadarm, and it'll remain attached until the summer. It brought crew supplies and experiments to the station, and when it leaves, it'll take waste away to be destroyed during Earth re-entry. Rocket Lab successfully launched their first Electron mission for 2024 on Wednesday. This mission was dubbed Four of a Kind, named so because it carried four satellites to low Earth orbit. The satellites are so-called Space Situational Awareness satellites, which will monitor near-Earth objects from space, tracking metrics like orbit determination, collision avoidance, and proximity alerts to a greater accuracy than ever before, aiming to have accuracy within meters rather than kilometers. This would be an important capability to have, with the number of objects in orbit increasing at an incredible rate, with massive constellations like Starlink, OneWeb, and the upcoming Kuiper all occupying a lot of room. The eagle-eyed among you may have also noticed that the Electron first stage sported a red band at its top. This is the indicator that lets you know that this is a first stage recovery mission. Because it's so much smaller and lighter than Falcon 9, Electron doesn't need to propulsively land, and instead can rely on a parachute, and I think we got the best ever views of a Rocket Lab booster recovery so far. We can start off with the views of the booster falling back down towards the clouds, and then later we can see the deployment of the parachute. Then fast forward a little bit, and wait for it, boom! Or uh, not boom in the literal sense, but there is a soft splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. The recovery ship was soon at the scene, here's the specialised lifting cradle being swung out. The booster is now en route to Rocket Lab's production complex for post-launch review and analysis as the company works towards its final goal, evolve Electron into a first stage reusable craft like Falcon 9 and relaunch a previously flown booster. China made back-to-back -back rocket launches towards the tail end of the week, with the two rockets launching roughly only four hours apart. The first was a Long March 2C, which carried 11 GSAT-2 navigation satellites from the Zichang launch complex to low Earth orbit, and official sources have stated that the satellites will be used for Earth observation, Internet of Things experiments, and the verification of satellite positioning technology. The second launch was a Smart Dragon 3, which launched nine satellites of varying purposes from the Bo Run Chi ocean platform in the South China Sea. Most of the payloads were technology demonstration platforms, though four are purportedly for Earth observation. All of the satellites were built and operated by Chinese firms Bar One, the next Sat One, a collaborative project between Egypt and Germany, which is designed to test remote sensing technologies. 
Lie on Aerospace had another busy week last week. I returned to flight with my exploration mode playthrough for beginners, with my space agency's first foray into interplanetary space, and obligatory encounter with the deep space kraken. <laughs> if that sounds interesting and maybe ominous to you, then be sure to check it out, it should be one of the clickable cards on screen, as well as another video from my channel that YouTube's algorithm thinks will be a good pick for you. But otherwise, thank you all so much for tuning in. This Saturday I'm hoping to have a KSB2 video about the little known Soviet shuttle that isn't the Buran. So look forward to that. Massive thank you to my Patreons and channel members once again scrolling on the left, but that's it. Thank you again for watching, and goodbye.